We're going to play a game called either or, or what's your preference. I'm going to give you two words, and then you tell me which one you prefer. Okay. Are you ready? Regulative. Okay, we should have had a meeting. Okay. <laughs> Regulative principle of worship or normative principle of worship. What do you prefer? Regulative principle. What does that mean? The simplest way to put it is that God has prescribed the ways that he is to be worshipped and that we must worship him in those ways and in those ways only. Look, I, I agree with you because I think we need to have we need to have our worship regulated somehow. Otherwise, well, some of the craziness that we see out there is bound to happen. Having said that, I have never seen the regulative principle perfectly applied in our 21st century context, and it seems that we dip into the normative principle, which basically is if the Bible doesn't say you can't do it, you can do it. I, I, I've because. We've got modern technology, we've got big screens, uh, we've got different instrumentation and sound systems and lights. The Bible doesn't speak directly to those things, so we right. kind of dip. So how do you say well, I'm regulative, but we somehow use normative? Yeah, so the regulative principle is about the elements of our worship. Uh, and so the regulative principle has to do with the fact that we read the scriptures, not whether or not we use an electronic means of magnifying our voice when we read the scriptures. It has to do with the fact that there's the Lord's Supper. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we use those little trays to, to carry the elements around. So the, that's sometimes what confuses people. So it, the, the regulative principle doesn't speak to what furniture we sit on. Uh, or those sorts of things. It's the elements of our worship. What are the things that we do in the worship of God? And how do we determine what those things are? The regulative principle says we determine what those things are from the scriptures. Is there one verse that I can go to that lists those elements succinctly? No. So how do I put it together? Uh, wow. So that's where we have to look at biblical theology here. We have to see what the New Testament gives us a wealth of information, especially in the epistles, about what the church is to look like and what the things are that we're to do in the church. But even beyond that, there are things that God's people have always done, right? Um, so when you look at it from the standpoint of biblical theology, the people of God have always been a worshiping people. And there are elements of that that we see that carried throughout from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Some of those things pointed forward to the person and work of Christ. And so we don't do those anymore, like sacrificing animals or things like that. But we refer to that once for all sacrifice of Christ. So what we do is we look at those elements that God has given us throughout the scriptures, those things that he has given us to define what it means for us to gather before him in worship. And we continue to do those things, all of those things that we find in the full counsel of God's word. All right. It's not the furniture. It's not the means. No. It's the contents that is guided by the Bible. And it's enough for us to know what that stuff Absolutely. is, so, yeah. in, including our long expository sermons. Um, I think that the, the, biblically it's uh, 61 minutes. But... <laughs> You know. We'll, we'll Google that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So second hesitations. Right What's away. your preference? Either classic hymns or contemporary worship? Um, yeah. So because everything was, was contemporary at one point, right? So the, the, the question is, who's contemporary, um, you know, are, are, you, are you choosing? And there are some contemporary things that are classic, right? I mean, I think, I think there's stuff that, for example, the Gettys are doing that would very much be classic, right? Um, in in their in their form, in their hymnody, and um, but I, if I'm if I'm forced on that, I'm going to say classic hymns. Why? Um, because con contemporary worship. There's a word that we don't often use. It's called contemporaneity. Contemporaneity is the idea that if it's new, it's better. That I reject. Right? We don't do things just because they're new, um, nor do we do things just because they're old. Right? Uh, but we do things because, because, of, because they're faithful. And there are things that have stood the test of time because of their content, uh, that have stood the test of time because of their 
their, their relevance to the church because of the his, their historical meaning and context. Those things are important and they connect us to history. And one of the big problems that I have with contemporaneity is that it tends to divorce us from history. It makes us isolationists. And when we isolate ourselves from history, we tend to repeat errors that history has painstakingly corrected. And there's, there's something about singing a hymn that's 400 years old. If you stop and think, you mean people were singing the exact yeah. same beliefs that I have today? But, so it's not, the, it's not the style of the music necessarily yeah. or the, uh, the age of the music. No. It's the contents of yeah. the music that you're after. So that, Sing to the Lord a new song. All right, so that, that yeah. leads me to so another either or preference. The church ought to always be writing. Churches, songs. however, yes. because of a desire for a particular genre, I like that style, I like that era, they've divided services so that there's the traditional and then there's the contemporary. And by the way, now I saw a church sign that actually says traditional, contemporary, and the bridge. Yes. Because Michael W. Smith isn't contemporary anymore, but some people like that, so he's the bridge. Yes. And the contemporary is the hill song, and then the old fuddy duddies come first thing in the morning. Yeah. Do you like that idea, or do you prefer that we are all together? Well, I don't like. I don't even like the idea of having multiple services. I, I, you go that far? Yes. Because why? Uh, well, I'm, I would argue that a church is a gathering, and once we start having multiple services, we're no longer a church. We're multiple churches that use the same building. Is that a bad thing, though? Yes. Why? Because the Bible's clear that we should be a church. We should be but there, a but, gathering. But there's practicality to that. I mean, if you're going to do it, just go ahead and be honest about it and say that there's a church that meets at this time and a church that meets at that time. Different name, if you will. Just It's, it's yeah, a whatever. different group. Because whatever. worship is that important. Is that what your Ecclesi core is? Ecclesiology is that important. Right. The nature of the church is that important. Right. And so, you know, we, yeah. See, the thing, that, the thing that gets me, too, just watching it, when you go to a service that's traditional, if you've ever been to the early morning service, it's filled with white hair, usually suits and ties and dresses. And yeah. I, I look at that and I go, there's a whole lot of wisdom in this room. Yeah. And then, yeah. not, not that that's the only gift of the church, yeah. then at 11 o'clock or 12 yeah. o'clock when the youth get together, yeah. man, there's a whole lot of energy and excitement yeah. that's yeah. going on. And both parties are missing out on the blessing of one another. Yep. Yeah. So yep. I, I get a church that does it. Would you say a church and, is and then you, and, then the, they do? and then the church has to make a decision about something, and you have different generations with different philosophies of ministry trying to make a decision about something as a group when they've never been a group other than coming together to make this particular decision. All right, yeah, so it's hugely problematic. Okay, so the option then for the church that's getting too big to do one service, they've outgrown the building. You would tell them to... Some people move, start a yep. different church, build another building. Yep. All of the above. Anything but splitting the all, church. All of the above. Um, Houston, I think we have a few problems here. Go ahead, Richard One. Besides the fact I'm wearing a cardboard helmet, Houston, you have got one of the biggest false teachers in the universe. <laughs> Are you kidding? He is so rich. Uh, how rich is he, wretched one? <laughs> I can see his house from here. 